Good morning, everyone. I'm Arla Wine, and I'm the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Triple Lift. I'm delighted and honored you all made it here this morning. Uh, welcome to the Miller Course in Triple Lift State of Programmatic Video Breakfast. We've been doing things like this over the last year in the largest, most important media markets across the world. And the whole point is to basically gather a small group of people whom we respect and trust to discuss the things that are important to you. And the reason why this is important to us is A, Chicago was one of our most important markets for us as a company, but also because the ideas and the things that matter to you inform basically what we do as a company, our products, our roadmap, our vision. And so these discussions where we as a group and a community in digital media can talk about the things that matter are incredibly valuable to basically set the future of the entire industry. And we're really honored today to be able to do that with Megan from Miller Course to talk about how she thinks about the future of video. Now before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about video from our perspective as well. In 1934, a massive earthquake hit Nepal, six miles south of Mount Everest. And the results were devastating. Several hundred miles away, in a province of Bahar, India, only minor tremors were felt from this earthquake. Fortunately, there were no fatalities, and every major building stood. But something very, very curious and odd happened in this province in India. Even though nobody was hurt by this earthquake, the local newspapers began reporting massive casualties and that the town square was destroyed. Why would newspapers publish what was clearly false? And perhaps more importantly, why did anyone in India in 1934 believe them? And so this question became an area of investigation by a scientist named Dr. Leon Fessinger. And he spoke with the locals at the time after the earthquake, and he created a theory. And this theory was that we have two parts of our minds. In this province in India, there was one part of the mind where people were really scared. They were frightened that this could happen to them and that they could get hurt. The other part of their mind couldn't rationalize this because, in fact, nobody was hurt in this province in India. Everyone was OK. And so he created a term for this sort of fight that we have in our own minds. And this term is called cognitive dissonance. So cognitive dissonance very simply is it's feeling one thing and having another thought that is diametrically opposed in your mind, right? Now, you may be asking yourselves, what does this have to do with video? What does this have to do with programmatic? And I want to share examples as it relates to our industry and to our lives. The New York Times recently did a survey about global warming where they asked people, will global warming affect US people across the country? And about 50% of the population said, yes, global warming will affect us. But then they changed the question ever so slightly. And they asked, will global warming affect you personally? And only 25% of the people said yes. So apparently, somehow, some people believe that global warming will affect everyone on their block, but somehow just avoid them and their family. That's an example of cognitive dissonance. Now, in our own sphere, we see cognitive dissonance happening all the time. Triple F has about 300 employees globally. And so we recently had a survey internally where we asked, how many of you have ad blockers installed on one of your devices, your phone or your computer? And exactly a quarter of the company had ad blockers installed. Keep in mind, this is a company in which everyone's livelihood and paycheck is based off ads. And this population of 300 understands the importance of advertising to fund the internet and information more so than anyone else. And yet, a quarter of the company had ad blockers installed. That's cognitive dissonance. And so we see this behavior happening all the time. And what we decided to do is use research to understand this cognitive dissonance in our minds. And we turned towards eye tracking. What eye tracking does is it, it doesn't use real-time campaign data, but rather we take a panel or survey of consumers and expose them to different ad stimuli and track where they show their attention. And why eye tracking is powerful is it gives us an insight into what's happening in our minds because where we decide to give attention is innate. We don't really control it. So we looked first at pre-roll ads, specifically on YouTube. 
And what you're looking at here is a heat map. So the areas that are dark are where we're giving the most attention. And what's fascinating about what our research showed is that 69% of the time, the very first thing that we look at is the skip button. We don't even look at the creative at all. Immediately, our eyes go to the bottom right-hand corner to look at the skippable ad. Now, then we took it one step further. Using the same eye-tracking technology, you can actually look at people's faces to understand things, what we call micro-expressions. Basically, the way we portray how we're feeling when we're consuming different information like video content. And so we started leveraging this type of technology to understand how we feel about ads. And so when you look at what happens with pre-roll ads, particularly skippable pre-roll ads, at first we're sort of sad once we realize that we clicked on something to watch a video and then an ad was served. But something unusual happens at exactly three and a half seconds, our sadness turns to happiness just as the skip ad button begins to appear. So then we asked ourselves, well, given that it seems that these ads that are forced to watch make people kind of sadsies, who in their right mind is actually watching a skippable ad? And so we looked at all sorts of different factors across different demographics. Maybe it's people in certain countries. Maybe it's certain genders. What we found is only one clear data point in terms of who would actually watch an ad that they could otherwise skip. And that's the demographic of ages 55 and over. Now, when you're presented with data like this, I'm sure your own mind is trying to process this, right? And, and this is an example of cognitive dissonance where, where we think we're, we're all a consumer. And many folks here in this room today work at brands or at agencies. And so one part of our mind says, well, I'm in marketing. I'm a consumer. I buy shit. I know what a good ad is. I know what a bad ad is, right? But then another part of your head says, no, no, no. I, I probably shouldn't listen to myself. I'm just a data point of one. We need to have large sample sizes. We need to have focus groups. We need data. And so we inherently have this conflict all the time in our daily jobs. Should I trust my gut about how I feel about this creative, about how I feel about this campaign, or rather should I trust this other set of data? And what's fascinating about this is all the tests we did on consumers across different ages and genders and cities, we did with Triple F employees. And the most interesting thing is Triple F employees are not representative of the overall demographic, and yet by every major metric that we did, the results were eerily similar meaning it, the behaviors of the general population in America behave very similarly, similarly to those uh, who work in digital media and work at Triple Lift. Now, we took this one step further. Beyond just pre-roll, we looked at outstream ads. And what we found was a very similar phenomenon that even though outstream ads are right in the middle of the page, you literally can't miss it. You're reading an article and there is a video ad. And even though they're often 100% viewable, the data shows from eye tracking that we actually tend to avert our attention. So we're in the middle of reading an article, there's a video playing, it's 100% viewable, but it actually isn't seen. We continue to con read the article right past it. Now, there's a term for this in the industry called banner blindness. And during our research, we started studying banner blindness. And what we found is that over the last year, the term banner blindness within the body of academic research was published over 50,000 times was banner blindness referenced. So it's it talked about all the time. In fact, uh, we looked at it, and just in the last few months, over 3,500 examples of banner blindness studies were published by universities and other research organizations. But when we looked at industry events, and we looked at all the YouTube videos and fed it through a transcriptor to look at what was talked about, the term banner blindness in our own industry was not referenced a single time. This is another example of cognitive dissonance. So we started looking at this and, and thinking about why does cognitive dissonance exist at all? And I think one thing that's helpful to look at is what is the business model of the internet? The business model that funds all of our paychecks each day. And the beauty of the business model of the internet is that it's so simple, it could be described in 30 seconds or less. Very simply, a brand gives money to a publisher in turn for that money, the publisher serves ads to a consumer, and hopefully the consumer gives consideration or attention to the brand. This is one of the biggest business models in the history of commerce, right? We all know it. Now the challenge is, it's very natural to put the brand at the top. Why? Because they have the money. They're the ones who fund the entire industry. They're the ones who largely fund the internet. The challenge with doing that is when the brand or agency doesn't get what they want, they call up the publisher and say, 
these ads aren't working for me. If you don't fix viewability, click-through rate, completion rate, I'm gonna take this money and give it to another publisher. So what do they do? The publisher hangs up the phone, freaks out, and yells at some ad ops person, we need bigger ads, we need bolder ads, we need to put them higher up on the page, we need to do this, we need to do that. Because their livelihood relies on this. And so oftentimes, they'll improve the metrics, but they'll do so at the expense of the publisher, and they'll do so at the expense of the consumer. And where the cognitive dissonance comes in is publishers are made up of consumers too. Brands are made up of consumers. Agencies are made up of consumers. Everyone in this room is also a consumer. Even though your day job may be working at an ad tech company, working at a brand, or working at an agency, we're all consumers. So we're of two minds about this. Yes, we got click-through up. Yes, we got completion rate up. But at what expense we served more annoying ads, ads that we personally may find objectionable. And so in order to remove this dissonance that we may all feel in our daily lives each time we go into work, we at TripleLift and other companies in the space are trying to pioneer a different business model. In this business model, rather than putting the brand at the top, we put people. Now you notice we don't call it consumers because consumers sort of has this implication that we're just walking, talking credit cards, that we're just people who go around buying whatever stuff we see on Instagram without thinking about it. But when you use the word people, you talk about empathy. We, we have feelings. Ads make us feel a certain type of way. And so we use the word people, and we put people at top. Now, when we put people at top, it means we're designing ads for people. And we know, based off this research and probably in our daily lives, generally speaking, people don't like ads. In fact, many of them hate ads. But when you explain to them that you have two options, you can either take out your credit card every single time you go website, or you can have an ad. And they say, OK, we'll have ads. Great. Well, now, now that you know you have to have ads, what would you like those ads to be? And so they say things like, well, I'd like to be able to easily scroll past it if it's not relevant. I'd like the ads to be integrated. I'd like the ads to be beautiful. I'd like them to be aesthetically pleasing, so on and so forth. And so in this new model, the ads are being designed for people. Now, the hypothesis goes, if the ads are designed for people, people like you and I, then they will reward the ad with higher attention and engagement. Higher attention and engagement means brands are willing to give more money to the publisher because the ads are working better. And rather than serving bigger, more intrusive ads to, to, the, to the person, they're serving respectful ads. In this new model, not only is there not cognitive dissonance, like there is in, in the old model, but also nobody has to lose. It's not about winners and losers. Rather, it's a sustainable model where the needs of people, publishers, and advertisers are met equally. And so when I'm talking about interruptive ads, I'm talking about things like when the, you're in the middle of reading an article and suddenly a video ad pops up. Or maybe perhaps you're trying to watch a one minute video clip but you have to sit through a 30 second unskippable ad. These are the types of interruptive ad experiences that consumers are noting that they find grating. So at Triple F, we're trying to create a new video ad product that takes in the needs of people, the people in this room. And what I mean by that is how to create a non-interruptive ad experience that you don't find objectionable. How does it blend in beautifully with the experience that the publisher has created on their site? And perhaps most importantly, how does it meet the effectiveness that brands and agencies require in order for their digital media investment? And so we've launched a new product recently that we believe does this called Branded Video. And this is what Branded Video looks like. It's a video ad experience unlike anything else that we typically see online. It has the video creative that we're normally used to, but there's a number of things that are quite different. First, the video blends in with its surroundings perfectly. The second is it provides context to the consumer with disclosure that it is in fact an ad, but also enriches the video ad experiences with text to share a much deeper message about what the brand is trying to say and what they stand for. Now many of you know TripleLift as a native company, thinking, oh, this is a native ad. But this is actually not bought through the native workflow in DSPs, this is bought through video workflows. You don't upload native assets like you would with native, rather, you can use your existing VAS, VPay tag, whatever video ad creative that you typically use can be leveraged for this new branded video product. Now, even if you have a compelling product, it doesn't mean anything for brands and agencies unless you have scale. And so I'm pleased to note that this product already today, according to Google, is the third largest source of video supply globally. So not only does it address the needs of how do we remove cognitive dissonance, and how do we actually create highly effective advertising that makes brands and agencies happy and meets campaign objectives, but has the scale to do so time and time again. Now, we applied the same concept in eye tracking technology I mentioned previously, 
compared to outstream because sometimes this gets bucketed in outstream. And unlike the outstream ad that was skipped, consumers are actually engaging with this because it's using text along with the article to create clues as to what the actual ad is. And so when we ask consumers who was actually in this ad, what is this an ad for, they were only able to remember about half the time, but in this case they were able to remember three quarters of the time whose ad this is for. Can anyone actually tell me who uh, this outstream ad? It, it costs $17 CPM, which, who the advertiser is? It's Snickers, right? And so this type of new ad experiences that we're innovating on as an industry are incredibly compelling because now it's not a question of, okay, are we just doing what's right for the publisher or just the advertiser and agency or just the user, but actually ushering in a better ecosystem for everyone. And so if uh, you're a brand or agency here today and you are interested in seeing this research, perhaps you wanna see what a branded video ad would look like for your clients or your brand, we'd be happy to do this uh, on a complimentary basis and in fact, we can go one step further and actually conduct some of this research I shared today specifically for the creative that you're running that you have in market or that you're about to have in market. Uh, you can email brandedvideo at triplelift.com or oh, I'm gonna hang out afterwards and there's a number of triplelifters here, just ask us, we'd be happy to do that. And so I think we're sort of ushering in a new era here where uh, we're putting consumers first and we're doing so in a way that creates sustainable infrastructure. And so I'm incredibly excited to continue this conversation. Um, we're very fortunate to have Megan here. Megan runs uh, marketing data strategy at the Millicore's media investment and precision team. Uh, she owns and pioneered the DMP product for Millicore's, the new customer data platform. She has a very interesting background at the agency side, solving problems and building tech stacks from a consultancy standpoint. And so I'd like everyone here to welcome Megan onto the stage. <laughs> Awesome. So I gave a brief background, yes, but I'd love for you, you to just share a little bit more about yourself because uh, from the agency side, you have perspective, yeah. from dealing with all sorts of clients on the consulting side, and of course now at Millicores. Yeah, of course. Hi everyone, it's nice to chat with you today. Um, I'm Megan Sullivan. I started my career um, at Starcom, and I sat in a whole bunch of different digital roles, everything from search and social to programmatic, digital buying, and then I um, ended my star constant on the tag team in a operations and an analytics role too. And then after I left Starcom, um, I joined a startup consultancy where I was helping brands, um, helping advertisers reconfigure their marketing technology stacks for increased personalization um, and increased data ownership. A lot of that meant um, going brand direct with a DSP or help us, we think we need a DMP, which one should we pick? And why would we need to reorganize our operating model in order for us to make this come to life? Um, after I left the consulting world, I joined the team over at Miller Coors, just as we were standing up data management platform. Um, and then in my role also, particularly passionate about programmatic. So I brought that under my wing. Um, and so I'm sitting as a center of excellence of one um, inside a much larger media team who is also very much responsible for our programmatic investment and our dollars there. Um, and then we're also <laughs> moving into a world where we realize we're a very data poor organization um, and we want to have a better relationship with consumers um, in this crazy world of data regulation and data privacy that's um, hitting us on the head right now. So we actually are going straight into it and hoping to build a better mousetrap, seeing that we don't have a CRM program right now, platform. Um, so we're starting to stand up that too. That's great. Um, you have a very unique model at Miller Coors. We do. Uh, brands and agencies are figuring out new ways to adapt to this programmatic landscape, especially now as even sort of things that were always protected like television are now moving into the programmatic ecosystem. So could you share a bit more about how Miller Chorus has built this sort of programmatic operating model, what it means even, uh, yeah. what it looks like, and where you see it going? Of course. Um, we definitely have a very unique um, operating model. Um, and it's been quite a journey to get to where we are today. And one would assume that we'll continue evolving it um, throughout the next several years, too. So um, in our current world today, we um, have a decentralized approach 
in that we have two DSP partners who are sitting in the room right now, my team, <laughs> um, our Amobi platform and Adobe. Um, and we have direct relationships with both of those technology partners coming out of a legacy um, non-disclosed agency trading desk um, relationships that we had several years ago. We broke down those barriers and created direct relationships with our DSP partners. Um, and then in the past couple of years, we've also had programmatic talent sitting over at Connect, which is a Spark agency. Um, and we've also had our channel planning strategy teams at the agency and then our media team internally at Miller Coors. There were a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Um, and so recently we um, moved the programmatic talent or we maintained the programmatic talent at the DSPs and we brought them closer into the table so that they could have a seat in decision making and strategy so that we could stay really close on top of their innovation models and the value that they were bringing into the industry and to the marketplace. Yeah. Um, so now the DSPs continue to provide full managed service for us, um, full s campaign strategy, tactical strategy, everything from PMP management and negotiations and things like that. And the channel planning teams and the strategy teams at the agency are really, really heavily involved in a lot of the upfront work. I've also found that my team, my internal media team at Miller Coors has become really sharp programmatic um, minds as well. Mm -hmm. Ask phenomenal questions and they're pushing us to really further the work that we're bringing into the, for our brands and our campaigns. Given the nature of the model that, you, that you've gone with yeah. and basically that programmatic is moving from this like interesting tactic to now being a core piece of how uh, Miller yeah. Coors buys and perhaps many brands or maybe all brands one could say buys, what do you see as the evolution of the agency model going forward? How do you, how do you think about your partnerships with them as programmatic becomes sort of the, the way that all media is transacted? Programmatic might be the way that the majority of digital media is trans transacted, but the coordination of all of the media vehicles is a really heavy, really heavy task. Um, and our partners over at the agency are doing a really great job of weaving this, the newest streaming audio to the OTT and uh, just your standard display ads and all of that. So I feel like just as everything is converging and becoming made available in a biddable environment through the DSPs as the vehicle, mm -hmm. um, like that increased coordination is at the utmost um, importance. Yeah, these days. you'll always need someone at the center to pull everything together. Definitely, yeah. Um, Video today mm -hmm. is a topic of, of today, yeah. and video is like all people talk about. Seems like is OTT. Uh, you go to conferences, and like it, it used to be like OTT was like one channel or one track, and now yeah. the whole day is OTT um, or connected TV or advanced TV. We don't. We're still using a lot of different language. Yeah. Um, I know it's a big focus. Miller Coors is a big video buyer yeah. in, in traditional linear, but also now in digital. And video means so many things. I presented like a few different types of video and how people feel about it, but that's like a small fraction of the dozens of different things that video means today. How are you thinking about video? How are you planning for video as a brand? That is a really big question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, last year, we sat down and said, oh my God, there's all these acronyms, and all of these words about video. So let's sit down and standardize it and make our organization all use the same vocabulary so that we can all know what we're talking about together mm -hmm. here. Yeah. So we did come to a common definition and we at Miller Coors call everything OTT. Okay. Not everything, but you know, like CTV and um, it's digital extensions <coughs> and things like that. So there's that piece. Um, but we realized that video, video is really important for our brand. It performs well in measurement. It historically, I mean, we're a beer company and beer belongs in video on TV. Um, so that has been an underlying and continues to be something that's really important for us. Um, but knowing that the consumers, people are um, changing the, the way that they consume video, that their preferences and their habits and their subscriptions are totally changing in this current world, we have largely overhauled the way that we think about and we plan video. And we did so in a manner that would allow our organization to be consistent across the portfolio, consistent across brands, but still make sure that we were able to leverage the, or find the pieces of video or the pieces of um, media that performed really well for our brands historically. Um, so in the past 
um, late last year and then again retouched this year. We built a program that we call, or we built a, a body of work we call historic, um, Holistic Video. And throughout Holistic Video, we take a look at all of the different channels, all of the different ad formats, all of the different ways of buying, all of the different um, inventory sources, and we draw a red thread through it all so that we can go to market in a really smart, coordinated way that we're both maximizing our dollars as well as making sure that our consumers are having a really solid experience with our ads and our brands. Um, one of my coworkers always talks about the time that he was watching an NFL game on Fox through Sling via Roku on a Samsung TV. And he's like, I don't know who sent these, I don't know how these ads got there, but we have investment through all of those partners and I saw a lot of those light ads. And so I think as we start thinking about this marketplace, this marketplace is getting messy because it's working because so many different people or so many different providers are playing in the exact same space. I would imagine transparency is going to hit this space pretty fast pretty yeah. soon. Like the ask to say, okay, well, who actually do I need to give a phone call to because of my frequency is too high, right? Um, and but then also from a consumer standpoint, so. Um, we're hoping that this body of work, this holistic video body of work, helps us build some of these guidelines to say, this is the, when we buy through this partner, they trump, and we do frequency suppression through these other, like all of that type of coordination, we've built up front in a strategic way so that we're making sure that the work that goes into market is the best work that it can be. In that example of your coworker watching the NFL game, were you actually able to figure out who was serving those no. ads? No. no. We still don't know. We still don't know. Yeah, and so the idea is now you have a, some hierarchy, like Samsung comes before, Roku comes before Fire, comes before We try, it's not easy Sling. and it's not perfect, uh -huh. but we've got some general guiding principles yeah. that um, help us get there. Yeah, it's really confusing. It's really confusing. Uh, but as a consumer, I appreciate it. Yeah. I love my skinny bundles. Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, yeah. uh, I think we want to have video everywhere in every form on every device through all of our devices. So like that makes, that's great for, great for people, but for brands and agencies, it makes, you know, our jobs incredibly hard. Exactly. So we're talking, when we talk about OTT and the stuff yeah. we're talking about now is generally 15s and 30s. Yeah. Um, but Miller Coors specifically, but also as an industry, we're seeing um, sort of a move beyond that, but beyond the interruptive ad model, let's call it, or to yeah. something different, a traditional ad model. Um, so one of the things I know, I don't know if you guys have seen, but uh, Miller Coors has a, a, did a large branded integration deal with Hulu across Hulu Originals. So for instance, there'll be a, sh a shot, um, there'll be a scene, and in the background there'll be a Miller Coors uh, logo, or maybe they'll be drinking Miller Coors out of a Miller Coors mug, that kind of thing. Not interruptive ads, there's no ads uh, for Miller Coors, but rather be integrated into the storytelling of the show. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that, how you're thinking about that? Is this a, a fad or is this like a long-term investment that could one day be a meaningful chunk about how a brand like Miller Coors thinks about television? Yeah, sure. So um, the content relationship that we have with Hulu, our organization really likes. Okay. Um, and we're finding a ton of value in being in, in those content experiences. Um, we recently got a new CMO at Miller Coors and she has built out, along with our marketing leadership team, a vision for where we want to take marketing at Miller Coors been really refreshing um, and I'm very excited about the directions that we're going. There's two pillars that I think are really touch on video right now. Um, and the first one is reaching new drinkers. Mm -hmm. um, and so that one is definitely be where the consumers are um, and be where those new drinkers are. Um, so maybe that means less Fox um, football, mm -hmm. but maybe that means more Game of Thrones, something like that. Um, and then also there is the talk worthiness of um, the environments that we put our ads into. So I think that is also another way that um, something like branded, um, something like immersive content and being a part of the consumer's world mm -hmm. and part of their favorite TV shows and things like that is something that we're we're excited about and excited to have that relationship with Hulu for. I think the Game of Thrones already has a deal with Starbucks, so you may have oh, a tough yeah, time in beverages. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. 
Uh, so even though brands are all into OTT, yeah. Melcore is all into OTT, I hear all sorts of different things in market. I know we have DSPs in the room who have significant OTT capabilities. Yeah. Can you share your honest assessment as a brand? Because I think we all know it's still very, very early in the game of OTT, mm -hmm. but it's all people, it's where all the money's shifting, it's where yeah. all our attention is shifting. In terms of capabilities, because particularly in your role in the center of excellence, like you're yeah. you're there to like monitor, can we do the stuff that we need to do? Does it have all the, the functionality we need as a brand? What's your sort of general take on where the tech is and capabilities and functionality OTT is like relative to what a brand like Miller Coors needs or wants? That's a good question. Um, I think we see right now that there's varying degrees, um, but largely there's so many players in the space that I think if if we needed to like dig a little bit deeper and find the specific need that we had, we would be able to find it. Um, I think right now the, the most challenging part about the OTT space is how many providers there are. Um, mm. And, you know, do we need to go to each one directly and build that direct relationship so that we can get the preference or do yeah. we just go into the open exchange and um, have to win bids, but there's no inventory, so we don't scale, so we can't spend our whole budget. Like there's there's a lot of challenges in the space right now that yeah. we are feeling because we do believe in the space and we do invest very heavily into the space. Um, so I think that's something where we are constantly in testing mode and constantly in, hey, swap this vendor in, swap this vendor out, sort of thing. Um, but I think largely the the OTT space. Um, oh, and then as a consumer, I'm watching my skinny bundle. Yeah. And um, I get the like pause for commercial, you know. And I'm like, well, why can't we buy that inventory? Right? Um, oh, so you're saying when they're serving blank ads yeah, or whatever? The yeah. Ads, yeah. Yeah. Right? It just goes dark. You watch ESPN and just like right. there'll be a black screen there for an extended pause period of for time. Oh, commercial break. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think there's still a lot of, we're still feeling that the industry and the space is early, um, is young, yeah. and is something that we know will will grow. Um, yeah. So part part of the your role in center of, uh, center of excellence isn't just sort of the programmatic execution, although you're like the right. person. Uh, it's around data and customer data platforms. Yes. Uh, and the like. Can you talk a little about that and the DMP? Like, because mm -hmm. you mentioned that Miller Coors is a data poor platform. Like, Correct. you don't really collect data. When someone goes into a bar, a bar and orders a drink, like, there's no cookie there. Oh, it's not no. a device ID. It's really hard to know what what's going on. Awesome that would be amazing, yeah. sort of. That would be way easier. Yeah. Than uh, yeah. So, like, so, but yet yeah, you do. You have made meaningful investments. Yes. Um, in data platforms and being able to action on it. Can you talk about how that works? Yeah. So. Um, this probably isn't a surprise to anyone that the brands in our portfolio all play in kind of the exact same space. We're not a craft where there is mac and cheese and crystal light and pudding, right? We are all beer. Mm -hmm. We're all um, alcoholic beverages. So um, a part of my role in data strategy is using data as a tool to provide our portfolio swim lanes and make sure that we're staying consistent um, both in terms of best practices and things like that, but also using that data as a weapon to make sure that we're very clean when we go into market um, and that we're using that as a strategic advantage. Um, so in my role, I have um, built partnerships with data providers for location-based um, measurement type reasons uh, or type purposes, mm -hmm. um, as well as uh, purchase-based data providers for all for the paid media side of the house. Um, and then right now, very recently, we're in the middle of um, exploring the consumer data platform world. Um, we, for example, give a half a million tours of breweries every year and never once ask for an email or a name huh. or a phone number or anything like that. Like, crazy, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. Um, brewery tour is kind of fun, I guess. Um, so there's all of these um, assets and resources and strategic advantages that I think we um, are realizing we 
have and we aren't using it all to our disposal. Are there other touch points beyond that? So obviously people coming into the brewery, but what other times would you be able to collect information on a, someone who drinks beer? Yeah, think about any time you've been to a concert, jazz fest or something like that, and there's the um, Coors Light yeah. cold experience and you yeah. walk in. Um, any time that you're at a bar and there's a t-shirt giveaway. Mm -hmm. um, all the experiential we stuff. Yeah, exactly. We um, have a lot of brand experience dinners where our master Cicerones will lead a pairings dinner. Um, we have a killer <coughs> Miller Lite ugly sweater that comes out yeah. around the holiday time. And we sell a lot of merchandise and some external agency manages and houses all of that data for us. Okay. So we're a little bit slow to catch up to, data is a really powerful marketing tool. Um, but I think in this, actually in this world of increased privacy and increased regulation, um, it can be really valuable that we're a little late to the game because we're now at this point building out a tech stack and a structure and programming that's hopefully going to be in compliance with um, regulation that's coming out soon. Yeah. Are you referring to California when you talk about regulation yeah, or just everywhere. in general? You just like look at assuming GDPR is, is going to have a, some sort of equivalent totally. in the states? Exactly right. So you mentioned the ugly sweater thing. So I don't know if you know, saw like Miller Coors, or maybe you could tell it like yeah. has like done the like largest ugly sweater thing in the holidays. And so you have all this crazy creative, uh, created a game controller out of a can, uh, the cam controller. Um, so you've done, like Miller Coors has done all this incredible creative, beer brands yes. in general at, are known for like having some of the most compelling ad yes. creative, um, along with like QSR. If you want, you saw can um, last month, like they, they like sweep all of the lions. Can you talk about how you think about creative differently for television versus social versus OTT versus like pre-roll? Are you, like as a brand, how are you, because you're creating all these incredible stories. Some of them are like 15s and 30s, but others like the sweater thing is like a two minute story about like the, the woman who weaves the world's largest ugly sweater. Yeah, um, I will have to admit I'm not as close to the creative decision processing. Um, but that's something where a lot of times the creative is designed for the channel that it'll be run on. Um, so, for example, the can troller where the Miller Lite can was an, there was a battery or a little packet. Is it real? Like, can I buy one? Uh, there were 200 that we gave away. Okay. We collected all of that registration data and dumped it into the lake. Uh -huh. It literally yeah. disappeared after 28 days. Um, but yeah, for everyone who registered to get one of the 200. Yeah. Yeah, you don't mm -hmm. seem upset about that at all. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, but yes. Wait, is that because you didn't have the like CDP in place? Yeah, we don't have a CRM tool, so we Got don't it. have anywhere to store it. I see. So we just. Okay. Um, <laughs> wow. But yeah, so it was a real can controller, uh -huh. a real controller built out of a can. There was a pack that went on the side of it, um, and it was released at E3 in LA, and um, we had a big pop-up event where some of the big um, eSports stars sat on a couch and played with our controller. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, it, was, it went viral. It was an incredible thing, by the way, yeah. to see like how you can actually turn a can into something usable. Right. We have a lot of like ad tech folks in the room here, and, mm -hmm. and you are in particular thing because when we talk to brand folks, a lot of brands are very focused on creative, very focused on mm -hmm. strategy, but you specifically are, are like the ad tech guru and which is a very unique skill set within the brands today. In fact, many of these like roles, even the center of excellence for digital media didn't even have someone like you, yeah. right? This is a new concept, which is we need to be very smart about technology. We need to be very smart about vendors, mm -hmm. about selection, about what we even need. Like, yeah. you know, is it the case that people at Miller Coors outside of you even understand how um, to store customer data or the importance of yeah. that, right? These are new concepts. What advice would you give us in the room, uh, uh, the tech folks, around building solutions, given that you, you like yeah. for a living evaluate a lot of this stuff, what do you sure. think we should be doing differently, better, yeah. and the like? So I would say that at Miller Coors and every brand likely, we spend a lot of, we invest really heavily in digital media and therefore are very, very, built these really robust strategies that from the outside looking in, you probably can't see. You're just seeing our ad when, it, when you're retargeted after you visit our website or something. Um, but we do have a really robust structure and rigor and strategy behind everything that we're doing. Um, and we have built really strong relationships with um, some of our big MarTech partners like Moby and Adobe in here. Um, and so I think that from coming out, 
an outsider coming in and um, to discuss with us the closest and the shortest, the path of least resistance is likely when you have a solution that's natively integrated or you have a solution that's available through our existing tech stack yeah. um, or something that is an easy plug and play. Mm -hmm. I think when there's the, oh, we'll sell it in, but then it's, there's actually no way to activate it. Yeah. Um, that becomes incredibly challenging for us because oftentimes, you know, those really exciting shiny nuggets get escalated and, you know, your boss's boss's boss sees it and is like, wow, we need to do this. And then it gets done and you're like, can't. We quite literally can't. So we, uh, an organization of our size, we have a lot of process. We have a lot of best practices. We have a lot of structure and strategy and rigor. Um, and whenever there's the opportunity to plug in to yeah. that big machine, um, that's when it's going to work out the best. You want everything to play nicely with yeah, to your really existing do. partners. Oh, got really it. Do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot to so ask too for. Much to ask. Yeah. It's, it actually, it may be. We'll see. <laughs> So you mentioned some of the things that are already uh, are top of mind for you. One yeah. is like getting more data and doing it in a, in a privacy compliant or sort of data like data privacy driven world. Yes. Um, what else are you thinking about? Like if we were to do this event tw in 2020, what do you think we'll be talking about? Like I I'm sure OTT will still be all we'll talk about, totally. but beyond OTT, what do you think are the topics that are next on the horizon once you get the projects on your plate sort of completed now? Mm. Um, there's a big project on my plate right now that we're just tapping the surface of. Um, and these guys right here are sitting, like leading the charge with me and that's finding six second video that's yeah. outside of YouTube. Yeah. I think yeah. um, those, those walled gardens are continuing to be a feat. Um, and really it's because it just makes it so hard to coordinate, right? I talked about coordination of um, all of the different types of OTT, and then you've got the coordination of all of their digital extensions, and the coordination of everything else too. Um, and then when it gets to those wall gardens, you can't even imagine, you can't even feasibly coordinate that in the, le in the least bit. So yeah. um, what we're trying to do is find inventory sources uh, that are as efficient and as effective as YouTube, mm -hmm. as YouTube six second bumpers, yeah. um, which is a really hard thing to do. So yeah. we're trying to be a loud voice in the room for the industry to find that type of inventory um, so that our marketing can be um, efficient and effective and consumer friendly so they don't have to sit through that 30 second ad before they um, watch that one minute clip. Have so you found it? Outside of YouTube, the bumper ad sort of inventory that you're working you're, on yeah. it. Yeah, we're testing it. We're in version 2.0 of the test. Great. Um, it's there if you work really hard. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm mean, guess so the, the front row here is like actually working on it right now. There's a lot of strong nodding going on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. So I think um, those wall gardens, those data sources, privacy are all going to be good ones. Uh, and so as we think about, like, there's one of you, there's one programmatic specialist yeah. at Miller Coors, or how many people work at Miller Coors? Uh, Tens of thousands, yeah. yeah. So how, like, how do they even know what programmatic is? How do you explain programmatic? Like, what, can you just help us understand what does programmatic mean to the organization? If I were just go mm -hmm. in there into the offices mm -hmm. and talk about programmatic, what would people do or say or think about it? In our organization, programmatic is often synonymous with digital. Uh -huh. We see just about all of the programmat all of the digital that we run is done programmatically. Yeah. Um, and I think as the programmatic pipes are being opened to streaming audio and to OTT, it makes it even easier for us to say, oh, you have a digital campaign? Okay, we can run that through our DSPs, um, which is great. It makes, um, we've got the best practices and the templates and here's how you do things um, and let's just follow these playbooks and follow these rules. Um, that being said, it's still wrangling a lot of um, stakeholders on my side. Um, yeah, brand managers. Oftentimes, yeah. Then we have our shopper teams, and we have our field teams, we have our local teams. We've got a lot who do mm -hmm. a lot of marketing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to open it up. You've been great about answering my questions. Yeah. I'd love to open it up. I know people are super nervous and awkward about asking questions. I may call on you just to break the silence, but I just want to open up for anyone with questions, thoughts about anything for Megan. We have someone in the back. I don't know if they have a mic for. Good. Okay. Thanks, Megan. Um, my question is, when you go about that holistic video approach, do you guys also take into account how you're going to measure success in order to not just bring in linear metrics or digital metrics? Because I know there's a lot of different things 
ability for the guy to look at through his eyes and not be measuring at the same time. Yeah, so I mentioned that we're a pretty data poor company. Um, so we don't have many conversions that we can map to or anything like that. Um, we do have a really robust um, MTA solution that uh, my colleague manages, and that is able to map to <coughs> offline sales um, through a partnership with a purchase-based data provider um, and a lot of very fancy data science. Um, and so through that MTA tool and MTA platform, we are able to get readouts very frequently on creative level performance and ad format and things like that. Um, so that tool is also standing up just this year um, and is something that we're working on testing or we're working on finding the best way to utilize, best way to optimize so that we're constantly putting the best ads in market. Um, so you mentioned that you are working really hard to get into these walled garden spaces and that it's highly difficult to coordinate. Um, and I know that being an alcohol company, there's probably a lot of restrictions for you, especially in a certain walled garden called Google. Um, so how do you navigate like the restrictions of these places um, in terms of like being able to like, use certain data, being able to run in certain places? Um, because I personally work on a very sensitive pharma client, and it's nearly impossible to be in these spaces. Um, so I'm interested in how you guys navigate those waters. Yeah, it is very tricky. Um, and our legal teams are very, very close to us, to me and the work that I'm doing. Um, and I have, I've actually done a couple education sessions with the legal team to say like, all right, here's data and here's how it's collected and here's how it's used. Can we use this, can we not? What do we have to change differently? How many different 21 plus regulations do we have, um, like barriers and guidelines, um, guardrails do we have to put on this campaign before it's acceptable to go into market and things like that. So um, we A, lean heavily on the technology partners to um, do their job at making sure that um, the inventory that we're receiving is compliant and things like that too. Um, and then from a data perspective, we're doing everything from demo-based algorithms to demo data targeting to whitelists and blacklists. So we've got a lot um, surrounding our bubble of ensuring that we're maintaining legal drinking age compliance and things like that. Um, you just kind of talked about like kind of like educating the legal team. You talked about like all the different folks that you're working with, the brand team, the shopper team, the local team. Um, you talked about kind of like setting the standard for the vocabulary across the organization. So it's one thing to be able to establish that, but it's another thing to like disseminate that out amongst all these different groups yeah. and having different values. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, that is absolutely not all on my shoulders, thank goodness. Um, I sit you know, as a digital person within a really large media team. Um, and so that really large media team has the direct relationships with the brands, with the shopper teams, with the local teams, et cetera. Um, and so that digital guidelines and digital best practices um, might be built very closely on my desk, but um, the rest of the media team is very much so a part of um, stewarding it, um, communicating it out to all of their internal stakeholders as well, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? One over there. When you're evaluating measurement, um, what role does that play when you're looking at all these different sort of technology and DSP partners? Is that something you guys rely on more internally or externally, or how does that fit? That's a good question. So just like I mentioned um, about how 
um, ad tech partners make their way into our walls. Um, measurement partners also make, like we have a very rigid, not rigid, we have a very um, formalized structure around our measurement approaches as well. So um, we have an internal center of excellence of one for measurement as well, um, who has really close relationships with his measurement partners on the outside, um, very much mirroring my type of relationships too. Um, and so he has the data scientists at his um, partner Marketing Evolution, who is doing a lot of that work um, and a lot of the data warehousing and data storage and um, data matching comes from a different data provider too. So um, I think we've built a really robust measurement approach and measurement tool stack. Um, and that's something where everything that we do has to be measured by um, this greater being. Is that helpful? Yeah. It's a lean team. It's like one person for all measurement, all programmatic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other questions? So, so like, from like a programmatic perspective, how do you react and navigate something like Bud Light and the controversy when it yeah. drops on like the Super Bowl? Huh. Mm -hmm. That was pretty exciting. So for those of you who don't know um, or missed it, maybe no one missed it, um, <laughs> Bud Light largely attacked Miller Lite and Coors Light in their 60-second um, spot in the Super Bowl, and then had a couple, I think, other 30-second spots also. Um, so that was actually our CMO's day negative one. She started on Monday um, in her first role. So we, um, we heard, or we saw, one of our field teams in Texas saw a point of sale on a refrigerator door in a convenience store and took a picture of it and flagged it up the chain and said, this looks like something's coming. Um, normally in the beer industry, the way that you get your distributors really excited about your upcoming campaign is that you leak them everything early. Um, but we were counting and noticed that they bought more spots than ads they leaked. So we knew that there was something that they were holding pretty close to their chest and then we found this POS and um, it like really unraveled. So at whatever time it was on Sunday night in the middle of a football game, um, we actually were a little bit ready for something to happen but didn't Pardon quite me. know what was gonna happen. Um, so there was, the PR was ready, the organic social was ready, um, and then when it came to activating paid media, that was a lot of all hands on deck, war rooms, 8.30 meetings every morning, um, and a lot of just real time getting ready to respond. So um, we actually, like the teams in the room here, did um, a lot of real time response, um, but was something that we just, you know, had to react to really fast. Wait, you knew, you knew it was coming? We knew something might be coming. What did the point of sale thing say? Did it, it was, um, you've probably seen it. It said, you know, the four simple ingredients. Yeah. And then it had, or it had the list of Bud Light's four ingredients. Yeah, and the versus list Miller, of, yeah Miller Light. Yeah, like whatever it said. Yeah. You've seen it. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Everybody's seen it. I didn't realize that you were tipped <laughs> off to it, though, and you were like basically were preparing well, never, for a response immediately. So very largely. Um, and the industry had never explicitly called out a competitor's ingredients or anything like that before. Yeah. So we had a feeling it was going to be like, or at least I had no idea this was happening. Someone had a feeling it was going to be like our competitors had this, that, and the other thing. But the fact that like there was a castle called the Coors Light Castle in the mountains that was like relatively unprecedented. Yeah. What do you make of that, by the way? The fact that there's like mudslinging in the industry, like it's beer? It's tough. It's tough. Like, the like why did they do that? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. they probably had a concept of that in their back pocket for years. Like, why did they actually like pull that trigger? It's what do you a make of I mean, we don't know, but like. The beer industry largely is hurting right now, too. Um, we're like hurting to wine and we're hurting to spirits. Uh. Um, so for them to pull down 
another mm -hmm. big brand in the industry is, is tough. Well, arguably it could hurt the whole space because at a time exactly. when consumers are looking at other things, and exactly. they cast they cast a shadow about beer in general, yeah. and, and it could be that consumers forget about which ones had the ingredients, which didn't. Exactly, it could, could yeah. affect all consumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunate. I think we're out of questions, but I just want to take a moment and thank everyone for coming this morning, um, and Megan especially. Yes, thank you. Of course. Megan My talked a, a lot about privacy. We uh, one of the scariest things of privacy is your webcam could get hijacked. So we've given everyone here a webcam blocker. So <laughs> hopefully no one spies on you. Um, and I think we're, uh, Megan, maybe you can stick around for a few minutes and answer any questions afterwards. Uh, thanks again and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much, Megan.